All right, it's 3.30. It's good to have you here. So as I, as I mentioned, there was, uh, and, and the gentleman here told me that my mic wasn't on when I was asking questions. Uh, so, so there was a session earlier today around 12.30 that talked a little bit about, um, you know, cognitive search. It was kind of an introductory session to some of our new capabilities uh, in the, the area of knowledge mining. And um, why, why do we have this session? We have this session because your needs are different from the person next to you. In a sense, you know, like you, you may be both developers perhaps, but, but you may be working in different industries. Maybe, maybe the requirements of your customers are slightly different from one another. In a sense, uh, we, each, um, we, we each bring our own flavor uh, to our applications, right? So we need to um, kind of take, take the, the knowledge that we're getting today and, and we have to customize it, apply it to, to our specific needs and sometimes that requires a little bit of extra effort. Uh, we want you to bring your own spices, we want you to bring your own flavor uh, to, to the tools and capabilities that we have for you today. We're also gonna get our hands a little bit dirty. This is a, a 300 level session so We'll, we'll touch a little bit of code, but once again, don't be too scared. We'll explain everything that we are doing uh, at every moment. So um, I'm gonna start with four different customers uh, that are very, very different, uh, very, very different. So we have uh, the Met on the, on the far left here. The Met um, came to us not too long ago and they said, oh, we have amazing news. We are." exposing, um, we're opening our collection, essentially, a, a digital collection of our assets, of our art, to, to the world so they can play with it, so they can explore it. over 500,000 pieces of art that they open to the developer community. And they said, we would like to know what we can do with it, what can we extract out of this information, how can we make this art more uh, accessible to people, right? So, so that's one need. Then a different customer in the other side of the world, in the Netherlands, uh, Royal IHC, uh, was interested in looking for ways to improve customer support scenarios. The problem there was uh, their support engineers were spending a long time, uh, sometimes they said even like 25% of their actual time, not actually you know, helping the customer, but instead finding the documents that will allow them to help the customer. So they were like, how can we make it uh, better? How can we make them more efficient? Spend more time with the customer. In the third case, the Microsoft Worldwide uh, uh, Learning Innovation Lab, they, um, they have a different problem. They wanna make it easier for, for people that come to, to Microsoft and wanna work at Microsoft to find the, the, you know, the best job that they, can, uh, that they can to fulfill their dreams, right? Like, so, so, they want to take a resume and automatically extract like the sense of uh, skills or capabilities that the person has and match them with the right jobs. And the last one, I said this, they have a contract management platform and they are interested in kind of processing all kinds of different types of documents, contracts uh, in, in all kinds of shapes, scan PDFs, Word documents, you name it. And they want to be able to do things such as extract clauses and then classify those clauses into different types of uh, clauses like non-compete agreements or NDA and, uh, and then provide structure to their, uh, to their customers based on these contracts. These all sound like very, very different use cases. And, and in a sense they are, you know, they, they are very different uh, customers with very different needs. But there is one pattern that they all have in common. In a sense, they need to ingest data, they need to apply machine learning capabilities to it, they need to enrich this information, and then you know, they, they want people to get insights from this information, they want people to explore this information. And in the graph here, I have uh, you know, cognitive skills as a, as a way to uh, enrich information, essentially apply machine learning, and search as an instance of exploration. But there are many, many different ways in which we can explore information. However, the ingest, enrich, explore pattern is a constant across all of these very different customers all over the world. So we are uniquely positioned to solve this problem. 
We at Microsoft have, you know, a bunch of uh, built-in capabilities, you know, pre-trained models that we have in the shape of cognitive services. I'm sure you have been to some of those presentations on the announcements earlier today. Uh, we have the platform, the machine learning platform, where you can train your own models uh, to meet your particular needs. And today I want to focus on a particular uh, product under the knowledge mining area, which is Azure Search. Why Azure, why Azure Search? Because this product uh, puts together all of these capabilities in a seamless manner. From the, from the data source, you know, where, where you need to get all those data, all the data and, and documents and understand them, all the way to the exploration capability through a searchable index. So we're gonna focus on that. And uh, last year at Build, uh, we talked about a new capability, cognitive search, that is, by the way, now generally available. Today, it's, uh, it's generally available. So I'm very excited to, to announce that if you were not al already aware of that. So what cognitive search does is it allows you to, you know, kind of go to your files, to your information, whether it's structured or unstructured information, it may be on, on Azure SQL or Cosmos DB, or maybe you just have a bunch of files on, on blob storage, let's say. Then we apply, you know, machine learning algorithms, uh, a set of what we call skills to this, uh, and then create a, full, uh, a fully searchable index with this structured information. So you can see the pattern again. More specifically, I, I like this, this version of it a little bit better just because it goes into a little bit more detail. We need to um, first understand different data sources, right? So, so we need to be able to connect to, to different data sources in Azure and uh, understand also different types of data, right? So maybe, you're, maybe your documents are, uh, as I mentioned, maybe you have some contracts in, uh, in scanned PDF format or maybe someone sent you a fax that ends up in a TIFF format. You have an Excel spreadsheet. You have, uh, I don't know, some technical documents that were written by one of your engineers in Word. You may even have, you know, like JSON files, you know, that have semi-structured information. So we need to be able to understand each of those file formats to be able to extract the, distill the content out of this, right? Remove all the, all the, uh, in XML, you know, imagine removing all the XML tags that are not necessary for, for finding the, the piece of content, for instance. So we have this document cracking stage that does that. The document cracking stage, essentially by, by the end of that you have, here is the actual textual representation of your document. Maybe sometimes they have like diagrams, or in the case of a scan PDF, there is no actual text there. It's just a bunch of images, right? Then it will give you the normalized images already ready for processing. And in some cases, there is metadata that is associated with, this, uh, with these uh, documents. For instance, uh, in blob storage, you have custom fields uh, of metadata. No problem. Uh, the document cracker knows how to read these custom fields. It understands the schema for each of these files. And then it says, OK, now we can move to the next stage, this enrichment stage, right? And there we get to define a skill set, which is a, a, a set of skills or, uh, or steps that allow us to annotate uh, the documents. And really, the whole presentation today is about the skill set, so I will go into that a little bit more in a little bit more detail. Um, in essence, once you go through all this process, you create a tree of information. We went from completely unstructured information to structured information, and structure is beautiful. A structure allow, allows us to actually refer to particular pieces of the document. You know, like uh, maybe I have a medical document. The document as such is not very meaningful, but if I have the list of diseases that get mentioned then, uh, there, or if I have the list of symptoms that get mentioned there, right, then now I can find correlations. I can actually train machine learning models and so forth. And then, now that I have that structure, I push it into a searchable index that I can query to find the documents that I care about. And I'm going to derail a little bit from my, from my core message here for two slides because I want to let you know that um, there is a new capability of cognitive search that allows you to take that tree of information, the enriched document, and project it. 
and project it into tables, project it into, into an object uh, uh, format as well. And the, the really cool thing is that it maintains the relations, right? Like if you project it into tables, it maintains the relations between, between each of those tables. And that is useful information because now I can use it with tools like Power BI. Uh, maybe I wanna train my own machine learning models. Maybe I wanna display it in my own applications or even create a virtuous loop where I have a human verify what the machine did and then kind of train a skill and then have that skill continue to process my documents. So if you wanna learn more about the knowledge store, you should uh, go tomorrow to, uh, uh, to the session at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning where, where uh, Liam Cavano and Brian Smith uh, from our team are going to be uh, talking in depth about the knowledge store and they will actually tell you a little bit more about how you can analyze the data that we produce as part of the enrichment process. So, okay, so we were talking that uh, we have this process, right? And uh, today we will be focused, as I mentioned earlier, on this, on this skill set. And this uh, skill set uh, essentially is where we enumerate each of the enrichment steps that we have. There are many different objects that you have to define in Azure Search uh, to, to get one of these workflows to, to happen. There are four actual elements that you have to work on. Uh, and we're not going to go deep into the programming aspect of it for each of these, but I'll tell you at a high level what it is. Essentially, it's all about defining what you need, right? So you define a data source, and a data source, you can think of it as, a, as a, a, an object that holds information as to how to connect to, to the source of your data, right? So let's say I want to connect it to, to, I don't know, to blob storage. It will have my connection string. It will have what container I want to connect to. Maybe I want to connect to Azure SQL, then it will have what query I want to do to connect to Azure SQL and so forth. So in essence, you, you specify the, the information that you need and you say, okay, now that's a data source that you can connect to. At the very end on the right, I have the index. This has information about uh, the, the shape of my searchable index. So for instance, I could say that some of my uh, uh, fields are searchable. Maybe I don't want some of my fields to be searchable. Just, just I want them to be retrieved, but I don't want them to, to impact the, the searchability of the index, for instance. Or you can say, oh, you know, I want this and this and this field to be a facet or to be a filter. This is where you specify those characteristics. And then the indexer is what holds it all together, right? This is the, the, the guy that goes, gets data from the data source, runs it through the enrichment pipeline in the skill set, and then pushes it into the index. So let's talk a little bit more about the, the skill set, which I highlighted in this, in this uh, slide. The skill set essentially it's a definition of a, of a set of steps that you need to enrich your information. So in this uh, sample skill set that I have here, I have um, you know, some text coming in, uh, some images, maybe I want to do a few things on the images such as uh, detect objects on the image, maybe I want to uh, detect faces, or maybe get the printed text out of those images, then Let's say that, the, that I have diagrams, usually in my documents, I wanna extract the text, but you know, some of my text also comes out of the document cracking stage as pure text, like actual structured text. So I wanna merge it together, and now I have like all the text for my document, and, uh, and now I want to do something else, maybe extract different types of entities, such as organizations, locations, places, and so forth. So this is a sample skill set. Two things that I want you to take away from this. One is that as we um, define the skill set, there are dependencies, right? So like some outputs of one skill going as inputs of another skill. So, so essentially you are creating a, a, a connected uh, graph right there. And the second one is that it's a little subtle unless you start to actually like try to do it. Uh, but there are cardinality changes throughout this enrichment process. So this looks very simple, but then when you have to code it, you realize, oh my goodness, when I, when I get images, I don't get only one image. I have 20 images for my document, and I have to tell the system to kind of extract the text out of 20 images and then 
maybe I want to combine it together, and, and now I have a single element, and now I extract entities, and now I have 100 again, right? So as we go through this, it's not that each step gets run only once. It really depends on the transformations that are occurring. So we want to be able to, to create a mechanism to make it easy for you to define that um, and kind of provide the context in which uh, a given enrichment step will occur. And we'll, we'll go through each of these steps. Let me tell you about, about uh, the Met, uh, which we started describing as the first customer in, in that list. So, so the Met, uh, they, they wanted to create a skill set then uh, that will allow them to, to enrich their, their open access collection, right? So what kind of problems were they trying to solve? They said, you know, Luis, we would love to uh, enrich our information, for instance, with additional metadata about the artist. You know, like we, we know who, who actually painted this, this uh, painting, but we would like to provide context for, for people so that when they go, they can tell the story of the painting, right? Or they, or they said, you know, wouldn't it be great if, um, if we actually could find pieces of art that were uh, done close to that piece of art in the same time period, right? So then that means that uh, we have to be able to extract the location based on the metadata and ideally convert that location into actual, an actual uh, geo point that then you can query, you know, like, and say like, oh, give me art 10 miles, uh, you know, from this point and in, the, in this time period, right? So it requires a lot of, you know, sometimes transformation, sometimes enrichment, and um, sometimes use of uh, pre-built skills, right? So we, for instance, have the ability to detect tags in an image. So if you have a plant, uh, you know, someone paints a plant, and maybe you are learning to draw or paint plants, wouldn't it be nice to be able to search for plant and then see all the pieces of art uh, related to that, right? So, so that's... That's what they did, and, uh, and then uh, we, were, we created uh, this, this kind of proof of concept, uh, enriching all this information and then creating an experience for, for, the, for customers, you know, like for, for normal people, right, to explore this information and find connections between these pieces of art. The catch was that um, some of these uh, skills were, you know, didn't come out of the box. They sometimes you had to tweak them a little bit, you know, like for instance, if you wanted to get the location, you wanted to use like a combination of sources, maybe the nationality of the, of the artist, uh, if, if the location didn't exist, or the city, and, and somehow combine them before maybe calling a Bing, uh, uh, sorry, an Azure Maps endpoint to, to get the reverse geo geocoding, right? So, so there were four of those skills that were for one reason or another, uh, custom skills. They, they wanted to create these custom skills. So I am going to um, walk you through the process. Let, I want you to kind of sit in, the, in, the, in my shoes for a second, like uh, step into my shoes as we went and defined what a custom skill interface should be like, right? So we said let's keep things very simple and, and uh, we, we established three rules for, for creating a custom skill. We, we, uh, let's assume for now, as, as we go through these three rules that I will tell you about, that we want to just have a very simple skill that it takes an artist name and it produces as, as two, two outputs only, the biography and the image of the artist. Very, very simple skill. So the three rules are we want it to not worry about everything else, right? There is all kinds of orchestration going on around it, but the skill should be simple. It's like, a, it's like a piece of Lego. It has one job and one job only, right? Uh, it should not worry if it's part of an airplane or a car. It's, it's just, you know, a two by four piece of Lego, right? So it has one job to do, and it should, uh, it should, we should keep it simple like that. We want it, however, to be efficient. We want it to work well with, with others, right? Uh, so that things can move quickly. Otherwise, it will take forever to enrich uh, content. And then the third one is just an acknowledgement that bad stuff happens, right? Um, it may be that I want to enrich a piece of information, maybe get uh, the biography for an artist, and that, that artist is not found in a database, or the network goes down, or bad stuff happens, and, and then you know, we have to have a way for us to, to figure out what to do with that. All right, let's go through the process. So imagine the most simple thing. And the most simple thing in my mind is, okay, let's just put like a property back with the inputs, 
in this case, the artist, and the output, which is also a property bug. And don't take pictures of this yet, because we're not done. Otherwise, you, you'll think that it's so simple, but it doesn't meet the other requirements. So wait, I'll tell you when to take the picture. So uh, OK, so, so we start with this. And this, this is fine. But OK, second, second requirement is that we want this to be efficient. And, and that means that I don't want to be sending this only once per, per piece of art, right? I want to be sending hundreds of pieces of art at the same time, right? So now I am changing this just a little bit. Instead of sending one, one, uh, one object at a time, I'm going to be sending many at a time, right? So, so essentially creating lists out of that, the input and the output. And then, <coughs> because the world is not perfect, <coughs> sorry, can I bother you with water? Please. Oh, oh, awesome. Wow, this is amazing. Kaveri is going to help me later on, and he's amazing. <coughs> OK, so all right, so, so let's say, because we live in an imperfect world, it's possible that one of these records will have problems. Maybe it will not come back. or, or So I want to be able to identify the input on the output. Maybe, maybe they come out of order, right, because we want to do so many things in parallel. So, so I want to identify that. So I added a record ID for each element. The record ID, it just has to be unique. I will assign it as the caller. And when you send me the response, as long as you just return that same record ID, I am, I am set, right? So, so things are getting a little bit more complex, but, but it's still simple. There is a reason for everything. And then the last, the last requirement is we said because things can be, um, can be bad, right? Maybe we don't find part of the output, right? Then I'll also provide like a set of errors and warnings. If you want to take a picture, this is a good time. So, <laughs> <coughs> perfect. So, so it, when you first look at the interface, it may look a little bit complicated, but it, it really isn't, right? It's essentially just a, a list of property bugs coming in, a list of property bugs going out, and, and some error and warning messages, OK? So what I, sorry, let me, let me make one point before I go there. We have talked about the input-output interface, right? We, we have not talked about, like, OK, so but the skill has to do something, right? And where, where does it get this logic? This is where you come in, right? This is, it's a custom skill. You, you can come up, and, and, and uh, this is where you shine, right? Create your own, um, create your own uh, algorithms. In some cases, this, thank you. Uh, in some cases, um, you may have tools, however, that, that may do that already. In the case of uh, the artist and Richard, I figured ah, there has to be something out there that knows about the world and can tell me information about the world, right? So let me, let me kind of make a little commercial here for, for the Bing APIs, right? So, so we have this is some of our cognitive services have knowledge of the world, right? Like, so I actually use the Entity Search API, the Bing Entity Search API, um, to grab, um, and I grabbed it as a custom skill, the Bing Entity Search API knows how to go and get information from, from the artist. It's essentially the same as what you go and kind of query for Pablo Picasso or whatever on, uh, on, your, uh, on, your, on Bing, right? And then get that information, they, they, they are kind enough to, to create an API that exposes this information. So I figured, OK, let's actually like, grab this together. So let me do a small demo where we're going to um, take the, um, just one second. Let me connect here. OK, so we're going to do two things. Uh, I'm actually going to show you. We're going go to go to see it in action in a little bit. But um, I want to introduce you to, to a solution accelerator that I'm going to be using for some of our demos. Essentially, uh, one of the things that, uh, that Kavir and I said when we were putting together the presentation is we said, you know what? It's, it's kind of hard to learn to code and do things. Why don't we, every demo that we do, we'll put it in, the, in GitHub somewhere. Right, so, so everything that we're, you're going to see today is going to be in GitHub. And as a matter of fact, it just makes it so much easier because you can use templates that we have already created for you. So if you could go to aka.ms 
KM solutions like that, you will go to the Knowledge Mining Solution Accelerator, which is what I was showing you. And this Solution Accelerator has a, a few uh, kind of nice nuggets of, uh, for you, right? If you want to start a cognitive search project, it has a front-end experience, it, it creates kind of the back-end service, and some of the maybe a little bit hidden golden nuggets that we have in the Knowledge Mining Solutions Accelerator is that we have a folder here that, I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger for those in the back, that says data science and custom skills. And uh, there is this uh, section called Azure Function Custom Skills. And there are all kinds of interesting uh, skill templates and, and skills that you can use. So since I already did the Bing Entity Search skill, I figured I will kind of put it out there for you to use. And uh, we'll kind of just go through it right now just so that you can see what it uh, will look like. So I already cloned that uh, solution into uh, Visual Studio right here. And you will notice that one of the nice examples that we have there is this being entity search skill. Everyone can see back there. If not, I can make it a little bit bigger. Um, so, but essentially, it has all the code to, to create a function that, that calls the Bing Entity Search Service. And they all follow a, a similar pattern. And we'll, we'll actually write one from scratch in a second, but the, the main point that I want you to get is that there is a, a, a skill and it has to do some um, deserialization and serialization. So it has uh, essentially, when you get a JSON object, right, um, the first thing you need to do is deserialize it and turn it into a, into a C-sharp object that I can consume. And so I have a, you know, a few, a few um, uh, classes that allow me to do that. Then I can use something like Newton's of to do that, right? So in this case, the, my input record has a single input, the name of the artist. And I have a few classes to serialize the response and in the response, I'm sending a little bit more than the biography and the URL. I'm sending uh, the image URL, the URL of the artist, license attribution, you know, um, and, and uh, a more complex types of entities, but, but you get the idea, right? It's still uh, the concept where you can just kind of go and modify some of these skills uh, to use them. In my case here, I, I am just gonna enter my, my Bing API key that I got from Azure earlier on. And um, I have it here, I have it here, so. And then I am going to just run this as a, as a local skill, just so that you can see kind of the input-output interface. Once again, we'll go and, and kind of write one from scratch in a little bit, so don't worry if, uh, if this seems a little too quick. <coughs> Sorry. So as you can see, uh, Azure Functions has uh, posted a local um, function, which is the entity search function. And I am just gonna try it from Postman. I have my local Bing entity search uh, query right here. And um, for those that are in the back that may not be able to see the actual JSON here, it's essentially just asking for information for two uh, artists, Van Gogh and Pablo Picasso, and if I send it, and uh, assuming that my function is running correctly, yep, it is, then I get essentially a description of the artist, an image URL, and additional metadata about the artist, right? Um, my main goal here is just for you to see that we're following the same input-output interface, and that you can go and use code that we have already written uh, so that you can start from that, from that point. Uh, let's actually see what the, what the Met did with uh, some of this work. So by the way, at, at this point, just to save a little bit of time, right, I will go and actually, once I have tested my skill, I will go and publish it, right? Uh, you, you can see the publish option right here uh, on Visual Studio, and then it will ask for your credentials, what's the endpoint, and so forth. You fill that, and then you pub publish it to, a, to an actual endpoint online. So, now, once again, let's go back uh, to the Met, and let's say I search for Van Gogh here. And uh, let me take a piece of art. And you can see as part of the, of the enrichment step here, 
we identified uh, the name of Vincent van Gogh, and then we passed it to our custom skill, and now we have metadata, additional information about, about, the, artist, about the artist in this case. Uh, some, some other cool and interesting things, not, not so much related to custom skills, but I have to mention them because I really like them, is that as part of the enrichment pipeline in this case, we extracted additional tags such as, uh, you know, this is landscape or trees or frogs. There must be a frog. There's, this, can, this thing kind of looks like a frog, I guess. And uh, as well as uh, we, we um, work with the uh, Bing team to, to create a, a custom skill for visual similarity, for instance. Uh, uh, so you can see that tree looks kind of similar to this other tree in completely different time period, but it's kind of a fun uh, a fun uh, skill that we wrote as part of this project. Okay, perfect. So my, once again, my main goal here is uh, for you to see the, the request response interface and uh, kind of how it fits in the rest of the, of the work. We have not talked, we have not talked, how, how do we connect, how do we connect it, right? It's almost like we manufactured this, uh, this Lego piece uh, you know, but, but we didn't say how it fits with the rest of the, of the, of the Lego pieces, right, to create this pipeline. So let, let's talk about that for a second. So as you go enriching information through each of these enrichment steps, you are essentially making a tree of information bigger and bigger and bigger. At the beginning, you start with just like a, a document that, was whatever, that has whatever fields were in your database, let's say, or if you were starting with a, with a file in blob storage, it may have like content, images, maybe some metadata. It's a very small tree, right? But each step that you take makes this tree bigger and bigger. So what you do is, let's say we have our biography tree, biography and Richard tree. And in this specific case, uh, in the left, I have the shape of the JSON object that the, that the Met actually had. So they had a document under that, they had a term called constituents, a uh, very fancy word for saying the different people that contributed to this, to this piece of art. So this has like uh, the artist name, if there was a model, they will have the model, a printer, they will have the printer and things like that. And each of them had like a role, a name, and other information related to it. So what I want to do is I want to tell my biography and Richard to work on each of the names of each of these constituents. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to provide a context. The context is on what element do you want me to work? And because I have a tree of information, I refer to this as, in this language, essentially I'm telling it the type of nodes in the tree that I want to enrich. So I want to enrich each of the constituents. That, that's what that little star at the end means here, document slash constituent slash star. That means, and take each of the constituents and please apply this enrichment step to it. All right, then it, it needs inputs. We, we discussed that earlier, right? Like what is the input? So I can say, you know, take for the, for the artist name or whatever, I could say a path like document slash constituent slash star slash name. And it will say, okay, that's a, a member of, of, of uh, each constituent. I can take that name and pass it to you, right? Not a problem. I also get to define what I want the outputs to be called in my new tree. So I want to call it biography. Let's say here is just a spitting something called description, but I want to call it biography in my, in my uh, tree. So I, I just define, okay, this is the target name that I, wanna, that I want you to call it. And it will add that element to each of the elements that are of the type of the context, essentially. Right, so th this, is, this is critical and, and it's not so obvious at the very beginning. So the, the cool thing is that this is, you are defining something but it's working on, on classes of elements, like you know, based on, the, on, the, on where they fit in this uh, tree of information. All right, so far so good, I hope. And then let's actually say how we describe it um, programmatically. So, Essentially, for, it, for each enrichment step, I have to define what are the inputs, what are the outputs, and um, like what is the type of enrichment that I want to apply to it. In the, in the OData type here, um, if it's a custom skill, it's, it's essentially this, you know, 
microsoft.skills.custom.webapi skill. Sometimes you want to use like capabilities that are already built in, right? And then in the documentation for each of the built-in skills, you just uh, take the, the type that is there and you just kind of paste it in the OData type. Uh, but today we're talking about custom skills, so it's this, this OData type. Then you, you can provide a name and a description for your skill. Um, these, these are optional, but they're very useful, especially the name. Um, we added the name, cap the name field recently, I should say, and it, it's very useful because if there is a problem and we need to provide some output, like maybe some skill is malformed or something like that, it's easier to tell you skill name blah is malformed than to tell you skill number three is malformed and then you're like, oh, which one is number three, right? So I, I recommend you always define a name and a, and a description. The name should be unique though, so that we don't conflict with, with other names in the same skill set. And then uh, for custom skills, uh, currently we support web API endpoints, so you just tell us where to call it, right? So now essentially you post it, you publish it, right? And then you, you will take the endpoint where you published it and, and stick it here if there is some code or something uh, or headers that we need to pass, there are mechanisms to do that as well so that uh, we have the credentials to actually access your, your endpoint. And then you provide the context. You can also optionally provide a batch size so that we know maybe you don't handle more than, uh, I don't know, 10 elements at a time. And then, uh, as we mentioned earlier, you provide the inputs. You can see the document slash constituent slash star slash name. And then you get to uh, provide the name of the, the outputs in the target name right here. So maybe I want to call the name just full name or, or, uh, or instead of description, I wanted to call it biography. Maybe I, I should change my slide to say biography here as an example. All right. So I hope I'm not losing anybody here. Let me tell you a, li a little bit about a different customer with a different uh, set of needs. So, so Royal IHC, I mentioned it's uh, this kind of Dutch company that uh, creates, uh, you know, they manufacture vessels and offshore equipment. They were very interested in this support scenario that I, that I told you about. They wanted to enrich their documents in such a way that they could um, more easily find them. They, they wanted, you know, their, their uh, uh, support engineers to be able to say, you know, I, I am looking for uh, sub, uh, issues related to part number PT532, right? And the problem is that sometimes that part is called with different names by different people. So, so as part of their enrichment pipeline, they actually uh, created like custom skills to, for instance, uh, sanitize the technical do uh, words to, to create, a kind of normalize the vocabulary of this, of this element. So very, very interesting scenario. And, and they were able to make their support engineers more efficient. So, now let, let's consider uh, uh, in, our, in our second case, what will be a good skill for, uh, for Royal IHC to have? And I thought, what, what can we do for the demo that, that will fit this scenario? And I thought, well, this is a Dutch company. I bet they have a lot of documentation that is in Dutch, uh, but they're also worldwide, right? They sell everywhere. Wouldn't it be nice if uh, someone that had a problem with uh, kind of some Dutch equipment will find the issue even if they only speak English, right? So why don't we together create a translation skill? And we'll start with, um, with this uh, uh, custom skill template that we, that we saw earlier. Uh, so in terms of the skill set, this is what it's going to look like. It's we're going to um, OCR the text, merge it all into a single field. So we have all, all the text in, in one field. Then I'm going to do, add two, two skills around the translate skill. First, a split skill, because sometimes, um, especially the translate skill that I'm going to write very quickly here, um, can only take so many characters, right? So, so I want to take all my content in maybe a big document, and I want to kind of break it into chunks. I'll call them pages um, that, that I can deal with in, in my translation process. Um, one really nice, the split skill is a built-in skill, I should say. And one really nice thing about the built-in skill is that it's kind of uh, nice that it doesn't break uh, like mid-word or mid-sentence. So you can tell it, I want pages of 3,000 characters, and it kind of says, oh, that's in the middle of a word, that's not very nice. So I'm going to maybe go a little bit to the left 
and, and break at the very end of the last sentence, for instance, right? So it understands a little bit of language like that. And then I'll translate each chunk or each page, and then I'll merge all of the translations back so I have the, the English version of the text. <coughs> We're going to use Azure Functions again. Uh, one, one little commercial for Azure Functions. I love Azure Functions. My main reason for, for liking them is because I forget things. <coughs> and I forget that I have to pay for things. So, so um, I like that Azure Functions, you know, you only pay for what you use, right? So only during the time that it's running. So, so that's one of my, my favorite, favorite things about Azure Functions. The other thing is that they support several languages. Uh, we'll use C Sharp, but then you'll see Kavir will use Python, for instance. <coughs> Sorry, I started having this, this cough on Saturday. I think I was too nervous. That's probably what it happened. All right, so let's go to, um, that was a joke. I'm, I wasn't nervous. All right, at least that one worked. Uh, so, <coughs> all right, so, so once again, I'm here in this, um, in Visual Studio, and I notice here that I have a custom skill template. Oh, that's nice, right? I don't have to write everything from scratch. Let's see if we can write or translate uh, skill. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, there are classes to deserialize the request, and I see that there is the input record data. That's like the property bag, right? So, I, I want to call uh, my, my field just, just text, uh, because I want to call it into, turn it into translated text. So let me just call it text. All right, so I have text. I have, uh, and then in the output record, I want to call it translated text. So I'm going to serialize that into, oops, <laughs> translated text. And, uh, <clears throat> And then we'll, we'll kind of look at what this is doing. So you can see there is like a function for, the, for deserializing my information and putting it into a, into a data object. Then I'm calling, um, then I'm calling uh, this, uh, what is it, sorry, do work right here. Uh, essentially, uh, this is where magic happens, right? This is with, where the actual work happens. And then the rest of it is just kind of dealing with errors, exception handling, and so forth. And uh, at, at the end, essentially, it returns an object with my response. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this do work. I'm going to go to its definition and see what it's doing. And it's not doing much. In this case, it's like the hello world of custom skills, right? So, so I'm going to replace that. It's just adding hello to whatever string comes in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add my own. And I'm just going to delete this for now. And uh, the magic of snippets, so you don't see me type from scratch. I'm going to add a translate method, right? So now, I'm not going to go through every line of the translate method skill, but essentially this is just like, I took some, some snippet of code that showed how to call the translate uh, API uh, in Bing, and uh, then I, uh, I um, translated the, the text accordingly. Apparently, it does, uh, I assume that the input record was capitalized. I, I think it doesn't really matter for JSON uh, serialization in the serialization. It, it, Newtonsoft actually kind of makes them all look the same anyway when they come out, but, and just to be consistent, I'm going to be calling the output record translated text with a capital T. And, um, okay, it, it doesn't find my do work method, right, because I, obviously um, uh, created the translate text uh, method. I'm going to send the record data. But one of the things that I did in the, if I peek into, into this uh, function is that it takes actually two, two inputs. You notice that I have the two language, the translation language right here. <coughs> and uh, I'll just translate everything to English for now. All right, so I, I am just building it right now and the build succeeded and uh, essentially, I mean really, that's, that's all there was to, to this, right? I, I changed the shape of my input, the shape of my output, 
change the actual logic that I'm doing with this. And now I have a, a, a skill that meets the interface and that I can, that I can run. So, so this, uh, uh, if I run it locally, we'll just test it real quick in Postman. So I have, um, make sure it's running, okay. Uh, so essentially I have here, uh, for those that are in the backend cannot see, I have two records, one in Spanish, one in French, and I'm gonna call the translate, my, now, my newly created translate skill, and uh, that is not found, uh, apparently, so 70, uh, oh, I know why, and this is good because you'll run into the same problem the first time. So this is all by design. So what is gonna happen is that, uh, you know, the custom skill is called custom skill template, but I'm gonna call it translate text. Actually, let's see what I call it in, translate, just translate, okay? So this, this is the name or, uh, the, of the endpoint that you will produce. Okay, let's, let's run it again. <coughs> but this is to show that these are real demos made by real people. Okay, so I'm going to call it now. Hey, and we get the translation in English of the English text, uh, sorry, of the Spanish text and the French text. All right, so I was thinking, okay, let's actually run the Royal IHC documents. And then I was like, oh, but those are private documents. So I, I thought, what are the, like, the most precious documents that I have that I should run through the translation skill? And I'll tell you later. But first, we'll learn how to connect the, the skill. So let's actually, I, let's pretend that I published it once again just to save a little bit of time. I already pre-published that. And let's actually go to Visual Studio Code where I, um, we have 10 minutes left, okay, I better hurry. This is my last thing before, uh, okay. So I just wanna show you two things. One is uh, uh, here I connect the translation skill. I actually just show you how I connected it here. Actually, let's just go right here. And then I'll show you my pre baked version because uh, just to save a little bit of time. So I send each of the pages you can see documents slash pages slash star. I translate the text and then it ends in the translated text field for each page. And then I'm going to merge it again. And uh, so I take the translated page, uh, text out of each page and then I cre create an English text. Just so that I don't leave you with the curiosity as to what I translated, I took my mom's secret recipes she, she speaks Spanish, so she has all this, she's so awesome, like she created all this, all this uh, book essentially of recipes for, for her grandchildren who don't have the respect of learning Spanish. And, but next, but thanks to my Azure search index, they will be able to taste the delicacies of their grandmother. So I am going to, I already had built the index because I figured something like this will happen. And, so I, I'm going to go to my search explorer, actually here in my, in my uh, application. I'm going, I created the demo 100. And let's say I have some bits uh, in, in my kitchen. I'm going to make this just a little bit, oh, what to be? Okay, uh, so I'm gonna search for bits. And you can see that there, there is the uh, enchiladas uh, recipe. Guatemalan enchiladas have bits, if you didn't know that. And there is the text in English that never mentioned the characters for bits, yet we found the recipe. And mom, if you're looking at this, the enchilada recipe is no longer secret. So, <laughs> all right. With that said, let's go to, to our last uh, discussion with Kavir. So I invited Kavir to come because uh, he has a real problem. Uh, he's part of the Microsoft Worldwide Learning Labs. Uh, organization at Microsoft, and um, we'll skip that. And um, so, so he has a very real problem, and I, and I really liked it, because he is using some, some of the existing capabilities of, in this case, Python, to solve some problems. Awesome, hey, thanks, Luis. Um, uh, Your mic is not working? Yeah. All right, if not, we'll no, do this. That's, that's is number two? Is it on? It is on, yeah. 
All right, let's do it. The quick switcheroo. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna get Michael right. here. Okay, so let's see. All right, there you go. All right, sorry about that, guys. Um, so yeah, like Louise said, I'm from the Microsoft Worldwide Learning Innovation Lab. And on my team, we spend a lot of time thinking about the relationships between people, um, the capabilities that they have, learning content and educational content that they've taken or are taking, and job opportunities. So their past jobs or jobs that they're looking to, to actually get. Um, so in the demo you're about to see, I wanted to take um, information that we had from job postings uh, and user resumes and basically build up a personalized job search experience. So you can see we have two indexes here um, and we're taking users' resumes and we're actually running the document cracking process of Azure Search. So we're um, doing things like you can upload an image-based resume and we can OCR the, the text out of that image and then we can extract the capabilities that you have. And this extraction of capabilities is our custom skill that we've built. And from this, we're gonna use Azure Search's built-in tag boosting strategy. Um, this is a scoring profile to actually boost uh, job opportunities that are closer to your personal set of capabilities. So we're gonna jump over to the demo. Okay, so better. much better. Okay, so you can see here that we have a mock-up of the uh, the Microsoft Careers page. So I can run a standard search. So let's say I'm I want to be a program manager. Right now I'm a software engineer. So I can search for that, and I can get a standard response. Um, but the issue here is I still have to read through all of these different job descriptions. I still have to figure out if this team specifically is the right team for me, if um, my capabilities and my skills personally will match the requirements for this job. So it's still a lot of manual work for me to have to go through this. Um, but what if I can just upload my personal resume? And in the background, what's happening is we're actually uploading my resume to Azure Blob Storage and triggering an Azure Search indexer to run over my one document of my resume. And it's going to run the process of actually extracting my personal capabilities. And then we're gonna see um, how that refreshes my uh, search experience, potentially. Yep. There we go. Just took a little longer than I expected. Um, so now you can see a list of all of the uh, capabilities that were extracted by our custom skill and you can see how well those match certain job uh, descriptions or the capabilities extracted from certain job descriptions. So you can see I'm really into things like cloud computing, so I have you know, Amazon Web Services, Azure Functions, um, I have AI, machine learning, things like that. Um, and then you can see that my search has refreshed so that the top jobs here, I, I'm still looking at the program manager search query, but I'm getting, um, the best match with things like Bing Search and AI. So that, it's a program manager role on the Bing Search and AI team, which really aligns with my interests and uh, my past experience and capabilities. Um, so you might be wondering how do we actually build uh, this system? And a cool thing that I wanted to introduce you to is this kind of Python interface to uh, um, Azure Cognitive Search. So we use, and um, in our previous sessions, uh, we showed a lot of C-sharp skills, and you know, not everybody is super well-versed in C-sharp, uh, like me, and um, having a Python interface allows you to bring really the rich capabilities of the Python machine learning and natural language processing ecosystem into your uh, data that's held in Azure Search. So this is still running on Azure Functions, actually. So our main function just requires this um, init.py in a folder, and then it will run inside of Azure Functions. And we're, you can basically see the, the input and outputs that we're expecting. So you send it some text. That text would be a job description in this case. And then we're gonna turn back this list of skills. Um, skills and capabilities for this case are the same thing. Um, and then a lot of the, the magic is just being able to uh, take that JSON input, deserialize it into a Python object, um, and get a lot of validation for free. So um, our demo has this, uh, uses this 
library called Pydantic, which had, does a really great job of seri uh, deserializing and serializing JSON to Python-specific objects. And now you can see that you can actually just adapt this to your own specific use case. So all you have to do is change this skills to whatever is important to you, um, and then you can get the, the benefits of using Python and some of the Python-specific Python libraries um, for your work in Azure Search. And just to give you an idea of what um, we're actually using, um, we're, all of the actual intelligence for the capabilities extraction is done using um, the library Spacey. So this is a really well-known and uh, well-researched library for natural language processing in Python. And we're using their built-in entity ruler component. So what this is gonna do is basically build up a, um, a matching uh, function to extract a list of capabilities that we've predefined from raw text. So you can see what a, an example pattern file would look like, for instance. So it will extract, uh, wherever it sees ML or wherever it sees machine learning, it will extract that. But you could imagine just using that for any of your specific use cases. So we were talking about um, part numbers, for instance, before. And you could think of how you could have a, a name for a part and then like a wild card for the part number or something like that and then being able to pull that out and put it onto your Azure Search Indexer. So we think this is a really powerful uh, pattern for you to use Python inside of Azure Search. And to give you an idea of how the documentation that we have available, we have this whole repo that has all the code that I've shown you um, and a lot more for deploying your custom solutions. Um, and all this will be available on the slides uh, as an AKS, um, aka.ms link. Um, and I just wanted to bring your attention to one thing really quick. And we have this, um, this separate cookie cutter project. So if you're not familiar with cookie cutter, it's a Python library for uh, generating template projects with your own custom values. And we've built up the, um, the models for in Pydantic so that you can run cookie cutter and then you can basically bootstrap uh, a normal like containerized repo um, that has a full Docker file that you can just deploy into your own uh, container infrastructure. So we think this is probably the best way to get started with Python um, for Azure Search cognitive skills. There we go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kavir. Uh, so, okay, so we have talked about how you can create custom skills. We have talked about the interface for those skills. We created a few in C Sharp. I really like this library that uh, Kavir has because this is a common pattern. I think a lot of people can reuse actually the GitHub repo that he used, uh, that he created using Spacey, kind of just change the data and now you have your own entity extractor for your own particular type of needs. Um, there is one pattern more that I wanna make you aware of and it's pretty well documented in the GitHub, which is you may use Azure Machine Learning. You may actually use the Azure Machine Learning uh, Workspace to create your own model uh, that, and then use, uh, uh, and then deploy it as a service. In the past, this was a little bit hard to do, um, but now, and the, the, the only issue that was keeping us from making it easy to do was that um, you could not create an HTTPS end, endpoint without uh, coming with your own certificate. Now that's not a problem. Uh, you can create an HTTPS endpoint that is automatically generated uh, as part of your uh, Azure Kubernetes service definition. In the same GitHub, the, the Knowledge Mining Solutions uh, GitHub, we have an example of how to do it. Like we have an iPython notebook of how to do it. So if that's interesting to you, I recommend you take a look at that. Um, I would like to invite you. I would like to invite you to, to apply what you use what you learned today, to you know, bring your own spice, right? To customize uh, some of the patterns that you have learned to bring value, not only to yourself, but to the ecosystem, right? By creating skills, uh, maybe you can share them just like, a, like Avir did, so that we can all taste of your flavors. I hope that you uh, enjoyed this presentation and we will be in the booths. We have several resources for you. Um, that we have the GitHub links right there for, for the solution that we did, uh, the learning capabilities extractor that uh, Kaver shared with you will be in the knowledge mining booth. And if you want to contact us and ask us questions, that's our email as well. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.